Good afternoon. Uh, and a very beautiful afternoon it is. I hope some people come in from out of the sunshine and come in and join us. Um, because today we've got a really splendid speaker, um, and I'm certainly looking forward to what um, Dr. Elaine Justice has to say. Um, her topic is uh, Passing the Academic Torch, which is uh, mentoring graduate student teachers. And many of you may know that um, Dr. Justice has been the steering committee chair for some time on ODU's Preparing Future Faculty uh, program, and been a, a strong advocate for that and been helping uh, with it. She's also been involved um, very early on with the development of the Graduate uh, Assistant Teach, uh, the Graduate Teaching Assistant Institute, um, the GTAI, that Brenda Lewis um, helps to organize every year for our new uh, GTAs. And I believe you presented that every semester right, to, to help them. Thank you. Um, also offers a course for graduate student teachers in the psychology department. Today, uh, Dr. Joss is going to focus um, on the need for professional development for our many graduate students, um, many of whom, and we hope a good portion of whom, will become tomorrow's faculty. So that's what we want to focus on. And even though um, much of graduate education really does focus on the research they, they will do, and uh, obviously they need to have their dissertations if they're uh, doctoral students, Nonetheless, teaching is a very big part of the process, and so um, we're very grateful to Dr. Justice for really taking the lead and, and uh, keeping our feet to the fire on this to make sure that we don't forget that, that very important role. So with no further ado, we will hand over to Dr. Justice. Thank you. Um, as the provost said, we're all aware of the changes in demographics. We all know that over the next 50 years, most of the baby boomers are going to disappear, and and there will be a whole new generation of teachers. And despite the fact, you know, that by its very nature, um, graduate education is, focuses on research. There are research degrees, certainly. Um, we know that uh, in this day and age of, of the kind of pressures that new faculty have to, in getting a job and in keeping a job, they, for funding, for, for publishing, you know, we, focus on that research and help them to build an, a, a credible vita. On the other hand, the minute they walk onto most campuses, one of their roles is as a teacher. So um, fortunately, I think most institutions are starting to pay a little more attention to this role. But I wanted to ask, um, get you to think back for a minute to your first teaching experience. Think about, had you had preparation for teaching? Did you feel prepared? And what were the challenges? Just a minute, kind of turn to someone around you and describe your first teaching experience. For a minute, okay. for a minute, because We have a volunteer to talk about Gianluca. Gianluca De Leo, so I can answer the first question is no. <laughs> I have not had any preparation for teaching. Did, did I feel prepared? The answer is no either. <laughs> I did not feel prepared and I had many challenges. Uh, language barrier was one. The concept of being in front of a class and knowing that you are supposed to be the one providing the knowledge to them. And I think it's uh, uh, frightening. It uh, is very frightening. And, wow. uh, and then, you know, many other challenges. But uh, it's, I think that teaching is not easy. And okay. uh, until uh, you, you start doing that, uh, you don't realize how, how difficult it is. Okay. But there is hope, because after you teach for a while, I think that you become better at it. So that's there is, a there is yeah. improvement. <laughs> so that's good. Did anybody have a course on teaching? Anybody in here? One. Um, where did you go? <coughs> Penn State University. Okay. Did Penn uh, State offer such, such Absolutely. A Very good. I did feel prepared for my teaching only in the way that I saw the teachers that I had teach. So in that respect, I felt prepared. But when I got into the classroom, 
that's where the challenge came. Okay. So. All right. I, I was fortunate. I did have at my doc, in my doctoral program classes, in fact, a, a year-long seminar on teaching. I later realized that was very rare. I think we uh, have come to realize, as you said, Gianluca, that teaching is a process. It's not as simply the content. We as doctoral doctorates, they assume we can teach because we know our discipline. And they're not necessarily the same thing, as I think we've all run into, to our, to our uh, dismay sometimes. Um, what I want to talk about now is a little bit, some of the resources that most of you in the room are probably familiar with, uh, but also a direction that we might want to think a little more about. Uh, the GTAI is a university-wide program where students do get some experience they get an introduction to the university, they get some presentations on discussions and, and uh, how classroom management and things like that, and they get to do a, a teaching um, videotape where they get some feedback on their own teaching. It's a start. There are, I believe, some follow through in some of the colleges. Is there anybody here who knows kind of a, a programs and I, I would like to learn about anything that is happening on the campus that I don't know about in terms of this kind of support for students. So if you know of it, please, please let us know. Yes, Carol. I believe there is um, a program in the College of Sciences which does help um, particularly international students. I think Gail Dodge originally got it going, um, although Gail's away on, on leave right now, but um, I believe it's sort of housed in physics, but I, I know that there is something that's going on. At Good, least. I will follow through. Right here in our own college, Dr. Appleton teaches teaching literature. She gives you the methods and the um, uh, strategies in how to teach poetry, drama, etc. I, I can't speak about her more. Certainly, that sounds obviously beneficial. And in fact, that is what's necessary in the departments, where you're talking about applying those processes to a particular discipline. Um, as I go through here, you'll, you'll kind of see that that's where we wind up, but also on the teaching process. Um, the Preparing Future Faculty Program, which Carol mentioned at the beginning that I've been in charge of for, for seven or eight years now, is a program that uh, started in the psych department and grew to be a university-wide program. For those of you who are not familiar with it, I would encourage you to make your graduate students aware of it. We do a couple of events um, each semester. They are, and I just have a list of some examples I'm going to block on otherwise. Uh, the kinds of things that uh, we've done are leading classroom discussions, mentoring and advising, ethical dilemmas in teaching, and uh, cheating and cyber plagiarism. All of those are topics that um, relate to teaching. We've done some that are at least generally applicable to research, uh, like the research foundation, or the research uh, development office runs a program on finding research funding and putting together research proposals for us uh, once every couple of years. So we do things that are somewhat related to research, but mostly the focus is, is on teaching. Uh, they can earn a, what we call a PFF certificate by having what we call a mentored teaching experience. And this is where faculty come in. We would like students to work with a faculty member, not just on the content of the discipline they're teaching, but on the process and on the teaching and what goes on in the classroom. Uh, they do that, and then they complete five uh, development events, three of which are our PFF events. And they can get a certificate, which uh, they can use to indicate that they've paid some attention to teaching and given, given some of their energies into, into being effective in the classroom. Also, with the support of CLT, uh, a faculty innovator grant from CLT, we were able to put the resources 
of our most popular event, which was getting an academic job, or the job search kind of process. And we put videotapes of events like finding a job that fits, um, marketing yourself on the job market, or and giving a job talk. And those events, or those videos, each have a frequently asked question. We have a mentor for these students, John Ritz, uh, in, um, who's STEM professor in education, is our faculty mentor that students who are on the job market can contact him with questions about that process. And we also have on Blackboard a discussion forum that they can talk to other students who are also on the job market. So those are things that have developed within preparing future faculty that stress things that are kind of common to every discipline. However, we get feedback and evaluation at every one of our events, and the most common feedback is, this was great, but let's apply it to my discipline. <laughs> Which, of course, PFF as a university-wide program can't really do. But uh, here's where departmental resources begin to kick in. Uh, in a few departments on campus, there are courses on teaching. And what I mean here is a course that doesn't talk about the discipline at all, necessarily, but rather to what's going on in the classroom. To things like classroom management and testing and grading and, and you know, what a good test looks like and, and how you handle a cheating incident. And, you know, it, it's within the context of the discipline. And yet, it's, it's processes that really run across um, and have more to do with, with teaching. There's one, as I said, I teach one. Uh, it's just a one credit course for our doctoral students who are in charge of their own classes for the first time. There is one in business, I know, that has, is a, prof a little broader. It's professional development. And there, I believe there's one in dental hygiene. Uh, but those are the only ones I know of on campus. Doesn't mean there aren't any others. Well, I was just going to mention that um, CLT also invites uh, graduate teachers to graduate teaching assistants to our uh, helpful technological things so that they can learn about Blackboard, for example, from the faculty perspective. And so it's not teaching, it's the tools to teach. It's but, the tools to yeah. teach. Yes, yeah. and, and I agree. You know, and perhaps it should, CLT should have been on here because I do know that your resources are available. I don't think graduate students know that as much as we should. Well, we try to tell them get about the GTAI, but yeah, maybe we need to market yeah, it a little bit. I just don't think that kind of from the time they come in to when they wind two years later, when they wind up being their own faculty, perhaps, you know, that they kind of remember. So we may, we may want to think more about how, how to, to get that out. I know I've been talking to Joyce a little bit about, about how to do this, perhaps in the context of PFF. Um, so we can talk more about that. However, I think the more common model on campus, frankly, is that students come in and they're assigned as TAs, either, either as a TA or even as, as an independent lecturer in, in charge of their own course, but with a faculty member who's also teaching the same course. So they get, you know, either in, for example, in our department, they'll teach a lab section of 317 a stat statistics or research design. There, the lecture faculty, tenured faculty member is in charge of the, of the training of these students. And similarly, if a student is teaching a content course on their own, they may be told, well, um, this faculty member has been teaching this for years, so they can be your mentor for this course. I think what happens many times is the focus is on content. So for example, the three, the, the statistics or the research design, the focus will be on does the student understand the statistics? Do they understand the research methods enough to teach it? Not near as much on the process. And we tend to teach as we've been taught and if our teachers, our instructors were pretty good ones, we, we'd model those behaviors, as you said. That's not a bad thing, as long as our instructors are good ones, you know. 
And what we want to do is to perhaps think more carefully about this as a true mentoring relationship. That this is not just someone who's going to serve as a resource for the content, but is going to talk and model and dialogue about what goes on in that classroom and how to make it a better experience for, for our students in the classroom. Students, and this is from data, I'm going to cite a study here in a little while, but uh, students rate mentoring as more beneficial than the training programs. So students would rather have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with a faculty member than to come to PFF or the GTAI. Not that those things are not worthwhile, but at some point, they want that personal guidance. They value observation of a model over discussion. So in fact, if there are, and I always tell them at the GTAI, good teaching doesn't happen by accident. If you have a good teacher, that person is paying attention to teaching. And therefore, approach them and say, I'd like to sit down with you and talk about my teaching. And um, that's, or to sit in on your class or whatever it might be. They want to feel involved in the process, to be able to give and take, to talk about what's going on in their classroom and to hear what the perspective is of, of the faculty member. Often this relationship does not happen naturally. I suspect, and I have not done this survey, but I suspect that even in my own department, that there is great variability on whether our graduate students feel like their TA person, whoever that is, really is mentoring them in the process. Some do, some I suspect not. And so it often doesn't, isn't just, we can't just assume it's going to happen. Sometimes this kind of relationship is re viewed as remedial. You know, that, oh, if I need help in the classroom, it may be ju judged that I'm not doing the greatest of jobs. And therefore, um, you know, or the teacher, the, the mentor may, may use it as an evaluative tool. Here's one that I think we fight, and that is that teaching is viewed as less important sometimes. And this can be something that students pick up from their, their research mentors. And the idea that maybe, you know, I ought to be in the lab rather than talking about teaching. I ought to be talking about research all the time rather than talking about my teaching or paying attention to my teaching. Uh, it's a balance, balancing act that I think we do as a university. We know how important the research is and how important their vitae is to them getting a job. On the other hand, they need this preparation as well, and we need to be aware of that. We don't really know as much as we need to know about what good mentoring is. I did a bit of a literature search and did find a lot in terms of looking at mentoring within higher education. They had various programs at various universities, similar to our GTAI or PFF or some of that. But recent data on individual one-on-one -on -one kind of relationships is really much more limited. Um, Boyle and Boyce was one study where they specifically evaluated a mentoring program, notice very small, nine faculty-student pairs. There was remuneration for this, so um, you know, presumably funding limited what was going on. They were asked to meet weekly and to keep a log, log book, on the meetings. And basically what they found, and they did follow up, and the characteristics that led to positive outcomes, number one, critically, the pair met regularly. What sometimes happens in these kinds of relationships is they meet when they need to, when there's new content to be covered, or when something comes up where the TA kind of goes and says, you know, I need to talk to you, something's going on in the classroom. 
Uh, so just having a regular meeting time to, to talk and to focus on, again, this teaching process. Reciprocity in the conversations. Not a one-way street. That the student really felt like their concerns were being heard. And um, it, it's interesting. As I said, I teach this, this course. And it's usually somewhere between three and six students. So we're talking a very, a very small group where each week, and if you looked at the, at the syllabus, there's not a word of psychology on it. We're talking about topics. Now, most of them are teaching, either as a TA or a, a classroom instructor. And my first question each week is, what's going on? And almost invariably, one or, one or more of them has some issue that has come up, that they're having trouble with a classroom management issue, or that the test grades were poor, or that, you know, it's as varied as all of you can think of, because you know the topics that you deal with in your classroom. But these are new teachers that don't know exactly how to handle it. And just having, I, I sometimes say, say it's part, part pedagogy and part support group. <laughs> because having someone to come to and to talk it out and then go back in the classroom and try whatever that is, is a critical part. And so that's ideally what the mentor is about. Yes. Elaine, how did they get into that course? How does that happen? Students who are teaching their own course as an independent instructor must take the course either concurrently or prior to teaching in the psychology department. <coughs> So, and that's by executive fiat, <laughs> you know, that, um, you know, that it, they, they don't technically have to complete the course to get their degree in our department. So if it, a student is a research funded student all the way through, they may not take the course, but if they're going to teach in our department, they have to take it. Yeah. Any, any other comments here? There were group meetings in this particular program, and um, so that also predicted positive outcomes. Obviously, the degree to which people are involved and think this is important enough to follow through with it did, did seem to have an effect. The other thing I wanted to mention about, because these are suggestions for you as mentors, what to talk about. If you've got scheduled meetings with your TAs and they come in and they're talking about a particular content, you know, how to teach something or, or that, you might want to ask them about some of these questions and get a dialogue started. For example, undergraduate students, who are they? <laughs> we wonder sometimes. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, how varied they are the gender, the ethnic, the background issues that enter into the classroom, depending on what your topic is. And psychology, certainly, those are, those are sensitive issues sometimes. In other departments, they may not be. But just talking about them. Another issue, this is an aside, I guess, for, from my own class. One of the things that students have a hard time with is where to draw the line between them and their students. Because literally, they're walking out of one classroom as a, a student and into the other one as an instructor. Do they have, allow people to call them by their first names? If so, what does that say to the students? And uh, you know, how do they present themselves as an authority figure in the classroom? Do they want to be a friend? That, that kind of discussion is an interesting one to have with, with brand new teachers. Teaching styles. This is a, there's a whole literature on teaching styles, obviously. But just kind of saying to the student, what do you want to accomplish? And how do you think you can accomplish it? Teaching goals. So this, this is kind of related. I knew that was the next one. So get them to think about what they want their students to get out of what they're doing. And then how to tie it to what they're, what they're doing and, and accomplishing it. Grading issues, that's a biggie, you know. And actually testing and grading, and those aren't the same thing, you know. So we have one discussion of testing and how do you, how do you um, put together 
an appropriate test. Uh, even simple things like how long should it be? How many questions? What kind of level of thinking are you really testing? Are you testing basic knowledge? Are you testing application? What are you really doing with your test? Then grading. And the, the one interesting discussion is the effect it has on your classroom. If you spend time going over tests or not, what is the impact of that? And, and there, there are dozens of questions. And also course preparation. Now this, this one may be ideally at the beginning rather than at the end, but dealing with the different kinds of um, things that you should think about before you go in the classroom. Uh, just how you meet the first class, what kinds of things you should do at the beginning to set it up so that you're going to have the most effective semester. These are, by the way, these came out of, of the, the voice research as things that students wanted to talk about. So open the door for them not just to talk about whatever the discipline is, but the process. Really kind of summarizing here, we need to somehow ensure that our students are being mentored. As I said, I think there's a great deal of variability across the campus in the degree to which our new instructors are getting this kind of one-on-one -on -one kind of discussion with, with faculty who, who obviously have an awful lot of resources to offer them, but um, may not simply think to start this process. We don't think of ourselves in terms of, of being, I mean, you, you said you came from a teacher's college, is that correct? So obviously, your instructors were much more focused on the idea of I'm teaching teaching and how to teach, whereas most of us, I don't think, think of ourselves that way as we interact with our graduate students. Ideally, Whatever program we do set up, we, we want to assess so that we know what works, what actually allows our graduate students to do better in the classroom. Uh, many years ago, I did a, um, just a paper at a, a discussion at a conference where I looked at the, was when I first started this course, it's been that long ago, it's been like 35 years ago. but. I compared the, the teaching evaluations of students who had taken my course and those from a previous cohort who had not. And I did get a significant difference. I won't claim it was a terrifically well-controlled study, which is one reason I didn't talk about it. But it did seem to have an effect. And so whatever we decide to do, we want to be able to assess and ideally disseminate that this is the way and the po things that lead to positive outcomes for our students in, in their teaching experience. All right, that really, I believe, is all I have up here. Um, any comments or questions? Do you incorporate some degree of one-to-one -one mentoring apart from the course itself in the sense that could you have your students, apart from following the course, also work with another member of the faculty in, in terms of the teaching side of it? And secondly, what do you think of the idea of developing a course that cuts across disciplines, especially related disciplines? So you could have maybe one in certain areas of the sciences one for certain areas of the social sciences and so on. Thank you. Most of these students have either are or have worked with a faculty member who is teaching the same course they, they've taught. Uh, they're not assigned typically as an independent instructor for a course unless they have done that, uh, usually multiple times. So by the time they get to my course, most of them do have a pretty good handle on the content. It's the teaching issues that kind of are new because this is the first time that they are the go-to person. Um, one person I have in the course right now is hoping to teach next semester. He's a TA at the moment. 
So he, in some ways, is not getting quite as much out of this course, although I've left it as either taking it before or concurrently because there's an argument either way. There's an argument for having all this discussion before you go into the classroom. There's also an argument for having it at the time. So I've left it kind of open since I only offer this in the fall semester. So they take it when they, when they know they need to. Uh, it's interesting, you should bring up the idea of a course. Uh, this has certainly been a discussion uh, among the PFF steering committee of the possibility of a four credit kind of experience that might be part of an expanded PFF, you know, where they would take a, a course. Um, certainly there are, are preparing future faculty, and just for those of you without, have never heard of PFF, PFF is a program that started back in like the 1980s already, was funded by the American Colleges, uh, uh, Association of Colleges and Universities, and really they gave funds to lots of different universities to come up with PFF programs. And these programs are extremely diverse. Some of them are very um, structured and have like nine, 12 hours of coursework attached with them and, and you know, very structured programs. Others, like ours, is much more um, loosely, I guess I'll say loosely structured in that students take from our PFF as much as they need. We get an average of about 30 people uh, at each of our events, and these are students who don't have to be there. They have just looked at our topic and said, this is something I need to know about, and they come. If they decide to, they decide to do enough to get the certificate. But it really is a, a kind of bottom-up kind of, of program that we've, we've built, and I think largely on the basis of the fact that students know that they need this information and the support. So the idea of a course, I think, is certainly worth, worth exploring. The, the psychology department, our department, um, also has, uh, offers our major online. And so um, the issue of preparing our graduate students for online teaching, which um, certainly many, if not most, potentially all of them will, will face as uh, future faculty. Somebody from CLT is visiting my class. That has been a fairly routine kind of, of interaction where our students do talk uh, to someone who has some, some knowledge about the, the online world. One person in particular, um, Dr. Ulmer, does a lot with future faculty, and of course they're always welcome to contact us, and we will, you know, sit down and we'll work with them and do a lot with them to help them to become better online teachers. Because you are right, we are going to have more and more online new professors. CLT is offering an online, online teaching course. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, a, a, a an credit, online on, course uh, no 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 an online okay. training for those who know that they they have an upcoming online teaching because maybe they're distance students and maybe they're graduate students and they're going to be teaching online so the training is actually online this is the first semester it's been offered so we can't report on how successful it's been but I'm you know it's going to be CLT quality <laughs> Perhaps we need to, to work harder to make sure that graduate students are aware that those kinds of uh, support at CLT are really available to them because I, I may be wrong, but I think the perception is often that those are for faculty and, and not, not necessarily graduate student teachers. You see that people who come out with a, you know, fresh from a PhD and they're very gung ho, uh, and to some degree our, our graduate teaching assistants too, tend to be very, very strict when it comes to grading. That you know, this is, uh, it is not a precisely correct answer, and therefore that you know the poor student gets zero, even though they've, it was clear to when you've been around a long time that the that the student had kind of got the concept and was getting there. You know, so there was no gray shades. Um, so how do you address that with, with students? Because knowing, you know, how to assess um, a, an individual's ability to, to get to the point, even though the actual final answer might be wrong, and assess that somehow in an encouraging way to the undergraduate can be 
can be yeah, quite tricky. Yeah, and I think what we're talking about it in, in my course is kind of the general flexibility issues that I think I can address, but on the individual question in the discipline, they'll be working with their own mentor about that. Just a similar kind of point here is, um, you know, making any kind of exception is another issue. And it's, it's all that idea of flexibility and that yes, and I talk about it, and we talk about it, is, is yes, in fairness to the whole class, you have to have rules that you stick by. On the other hand, there is no absolute rule. There's an exception to every rule. And so that you have to kind of get comfortable with where to draw that line and when to make the exceptions. Um, here again, I mean, the mentoring thing allows you as the faculty member to sit there and say, okay, this has happened to me. And this is where I drew the line. And, 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 you know, those kinds of examples coming from someone they know and respect is much more important than kind of the general presentation kind of thing. So, uh, you know, we, I, I try to present a classroom atmosphere that is supportive enough of the students that they're willing to share those concerns and talk about them. I have a rule, I say every semester, what goes, send in this room, stays in this room. I'm not going to tell anybody anything you say. Uh, you know, and I think they are comfortable with that. And then I can address those kinds of issues. Yeah. My sort of in, enduring uh, lesson from, from grad school, and, and I had a, a very, I, I think personally, a very good mentor, was the sort of the, the danger of spending too much time preparing for teaching. And, and in some ways, looking back and thinking of the, the colleagues I had in graduate school and, and also here now, graduate students in, at, at uh, this, this school, is that the biggest problem they faced, or we faced, was to spend too much time. And in some ways, the more courses you put out there, uh, the more sort of ideas on, on new techniques, in some ways you also encourage graduate students to even spend more time on teaching. And after all, as my mentor was very clear, saying that your job is to get through here, and that's by writing dissertation. And, and no matter how good teacher you are, if you don't write that dissertation, you will never get out of here. Yeah. So, so I, I think it's easy to sort of, so, so my rather question is that how do you get that message through? I mean, getting out is the, the key goal. Now, being a de decent teacher is also important, but you, you cannot forget the goal. Most mentors are very aware yeah. that that's the goal, yeah. are very aware that the only way their student is going to get a job is to have a significant number of publications and, and maybe some funding. And you know, so building that research program and getting that thesis or dissertation finished, I mean, that's the focus of our being here at the university, really, and, and training graduate students. I, th you know, the reason for this focus is that sometimes it's almost to the exclusion of teaching and that a student is more likely to get the message of don't spend, don't spend time teaching. Don't spend time on your teaching. Do the best you can, but just get it done. And notice that short changes are another student, our undergraduates. In some ways, you do get an immediate sort of sense of satisfaction. You get a response. Mm -hmm. You get, you know, students love you. And, and sort of it's very easy to spend time on that, whereas, you know, okay. the research and writing is a long-term project that really takes effort and pain. Uh, so, so I think that the mentoring thing I think is excellent, but it's important that the mentor then is connected to the research project. Okay. That, that I think I, is probably I certainly key. don't disagree with the idea of, of urging them to pay significant and important critical attention to their research. I don't disagree with that. Yeah. Well, I think I can provide you with the, the exact opposite, uh, and it's what happened in my college. Uh, I recently found out that uh, none of our PhD students uh, has ever taught a class. None of them. It's, we are not structured for doing it. Eh? Uh, and uh, recently one of his students came to me and she was uh, concerned because she really, she really wants to become a faculty. And I, actually I told her, I said, you know, you can probably write a lot of papers and even get funded, but unless you are going to be extremely good in funding, 
I don't know if you're going to find a job in any academia, uh, in any university in this country, if you never taught even a class as a TA. Because in the end of the story, the majority of the university, you know, the teaching component is important because, you know, you are going to teach a class. Unless, I mean, you are bringing like a million dollars of funding because you invented something or you have a great idea or you are a genius, you end up teaching a class. You, there is no way to do it. So I'm concerned about these students because she may go up at one point and, you know, when you had to pick two candidates, I think that if I were in the search committee, I would pick the one who had taught a class during the PhD. Yeah. So yeah, and the I, thing I, is, some students don't wind up at a university. Right. There are many, many jobs out there at community colleges and liberal arts colleges and uh, small four-year colleges that don't have the emphasis on research that by definition a PhD granting institution does. And so we have to be aware that in some cases at least our students are not going to wind up, even though they must finish their dissertation and their thesis, etc., they're not going to wind up in a, in a position where those skills are as required as skills in the classroom. Other comments? The rubric that I had when I started out was you start with full points and then you keep marking off each thing that's wrong. And it occurred to me that um, this was, every minus was a message to the student that they were falling short. And so I've changed my grading procedure where I underline the part uh, um, that is correct and I give a check. And then at the end, I count up the checks and those are the points that they have earned rather than the points that have been subtracted. Um, that requires of me as an instructor because I am grading lab papers. So everything is written. Um, and they're usually three to six pages long. I have 72 students, and I still go through with a red pen, phrase by phrase. Another thing is I understand that there's a, a broad definition of language. So one of our answers was that part of the scientific process was replication. But as I was thinking this through, I also accepted repetition. I also accepted duplication. I also accepted doing it over and over. So I used synonyms that, that meant uh, the same as the word that we were working for. And then when I reviewed, uh, I also hand back all of the papers the next week. I don't keep them. I, in my past, I had papers that a professor would keep four to six weeks before we would see them again. But I work to get them back the next week. And then when everyone has their paper in front of them, we review the concepts that as a class they missed the most. And this also very much helps with this feeling of, oh, I'm stupid, I missed this problem. It's like, as a class, this is a concept that we need to repeat. So these are the kinds of things that you would talk with the graduate students about, about how they present their grading is going to have a, um, an effect on their class. Yes. It's interesting, if I might comment um, on your grading system. Isn't it funny how we tell our students, do not use the words in the book? <laughs> <laughs> and, and so they try to come up with all of these other ways, and then we grade them wrong because they didn't tell us what we wanted to hear. And, and here these students are saying, okay, we don't want to say replicate. Well, let's, well, what's another word for that? And then sometimes we penalize them for that. Mm. So, so it is a, a dichotomy. Yeah. I agree with your emphasis on mentoring as against uh, sort of getting people through a course. On the other hand, we at Old Dominion University, we have a couple of issues. One may be that we get a large number of new teachers in the form of adjunct teachers, who some of whom may be well prepared to teach and some of whom may not be. Now, they don't have a lot of time 
in their lives to go through new courses. So my first question is, are there ways in which we can use technology to make some of these things you talked about available to these people so that we can publicize that? Not, I know that not everybody will make use of them, but at least we can make them available. And that's the first question. The second is, for all teachers, you need to be reminded of things, even after you have taught for a while, because you get into bad habits. So, and this is not just about graduate students, this is about all teachers. Are there ways in which we could develop conversations of teaching, not a conversation like this, because here, we come, we listen, and we have different topics. But a structured conversation, maybe within a college, maybe within a department, that might give some emphasis on the importance of teaching. Chandra, I actually certainly agree with you. And actually have, uh, because we have, as a psychology department, we have a thousand majors. So we have a great many adjunct and lecturers and GTAs and so on. So I actually am coordinating a meeting uh, where I've invited all of the adjuncts to come on a Friday afternoon and just talk about what's going on with them, what resources, what supports they may need, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, at least in one department, uh, that discussion is going on, and I suspect in other departments. But, um, you know, Joyce, did you want to say anything about the, the resources that CLT has? What we are doing with one particular department, I'll just use that as an example. Here on campus, I have observed all of the members of the department teaching. Then I took that information, you know, aggregated all the data, put it together, and then we're doing specific workshops to help the various people with that particular problem that came up over and over again. With that, then we're no evaluation going on, but just observing, seeing what's there, what's not there, and then we're able to help them with a de at a department level. Currently, we have one department who is interested in it, and it looks like in the spring we might have two. We're working. I mean, I know compared to the 42 different departments we have, that's not all of them or anything, but. Let's start with one, then the two, and then continue to grow with that. For the adjuncts, we have workshops for them, and we hold them at 4.30 in the afternoon on two different days of the week, so they're you know, available to come to those. We also have invited them to our regular new faculty workshops, and someone in the back row here is uh, uh, someone who attends regularly, but it's something that we know that it's an usually and typically an area that is not supported through faculty development. When I talked to the department chairs, they agreed. Their adjuncts feel left out. They don't feel part of the university. I even encourage some of them talk to the department chair and find out where your course fits into the sequence of events. How does it go into the program of study and why is it important that what you're teaching is important? So we're beginning to work in that area and I know we've gone to a couple of meetings together. We're working with future faculty and bringing them involved. I've also observed some of them teaching and then we sit down and actually talk about this was here good. What about could you incorporate a piece of technology? All those things. So we're starting to be very specific on what we're working with them. Of course the provost conversations with our wonderful speaker this afternoon. <laughs> actually helps all the process. Well, I know time is coming and we all have, have places to go. So I, I thank you very much for coming and participating in the conversation. Thank you.